going to get federation status for the strength lift meets? Well, there's an interesting question. <laughs> Our Hillary voter over here can answer that right, right quickly. <laughs> well, you, you guys are right. <laughs> hey! You feel reinforced now, don't you, Tom? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> now you're all validated, aren't you? We are in the process of I'm actually talking with our legal counsel, uh, Brody Button Esquire, about actually setting up a full-on thing. And we're we're going to be holding two meets this year, both in the spring and the fall, and they are going to serve as qualifiers for a national meet, which will probably occur in January 2018. Uh, and as part of that, we'll actually be able to sanction meets so they don't necessarily have to be part of, you know, like the big combined meets if somebody wants to hold a meet and we trust them to do so and they can do it to our satisfaction. They can hold meets on their own but also qualify for nationals. So we're in that process. It's kind of a big pain in the ass. Uh, and it is guaranteed to make me absolutely no money and take me a lot of time. So <laughs> there's, uh, there's that too. Um, but yes. Very awesome. Thanks. So I work at a college, and that comes with a free <laughs> membership to the college gym, right? And we all. What do you do some, at the college? I teach history. Oh, you're not doing strength and conditioning at the college. No. All right. Um, but I get a lot of questions, and I hear a lot of stuff from the other people who are there working out. Right. I think the thing I hear most often is people saying that in order to get stronger, you're having to actually tear the muscles, and then they, you rebuild them. <clears throat> um, and I, I think the implication there is that soreness sure. is what your your goal sure. is when you work out. Does I your college that, have a uh, have like a physiology department? It does. Yes. Maybe you could go over there and get them to draft a statement about muscle tissue and explain why that's not true. Well, that's, that was going to be my get question. Get some work right? out of the lazy bastards. <laughs> I mean, it's just a misunderstanding of muscle physiology. It's all that is. Mm -hmm. And somebody, I mean, it is, after all, a college. Somebody must understand that at the college biology department. Maybe you could get some help over there. Is that asking too much, you think? What's your actual question? Well, is there like a, a quick and easy way actual... to, to, to answer that? When, when somebody tells me that, I know that's not true, but I don't really know what to say to, to, to well, set them what straight. What I'm suggesting is that you get the biology department to help you with that. <laughs> I have an idea. My suggestion Stop is, caring. is, yeah, you're right, man. Yeah, then, <laughs> <laughs> Disagree with the shortest approach, the simplest approach, but to say, yeah, that's you know, that's a good point. Thanks. Now I'll talk to you later. If I can do, I think Dr. Brocky probably has some thought on this. I trained at a college gym for about three minutes, seven years or so, two different college gyms, and that's actually the first one is where I started my novice LP. Started training there. Squatted 165 for a set of five on my first day. All that time later, by the end of my time at a college gym, that is where I started coaching almost everybody in the gym in preparation to get my starting strength coach credential. So your best option, if you actually want to do some effort and not <laughs> just say, yeah, man, see you later. Get your squat to 500. You'll be the only person doing it in the gym and then people will be asking you, and you can tell them, and they'll listen to you. Because that's what Ooh, I'm that's a that's a much better answer than my yes, dismissive so bullshit. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as I put the fourth plate on my squat, I was already squatting more than anyone else in the gym. There were some people in the threes. As soon as I put the fourth plate on, everyone started asking me for advice, and I said, "Well, shit, let me teach you how to squat. Let me teach you how to pull. Teach you how to press." And I kept training during that whole time. As my weights went up, more people, more people came to a seminar. Now people like you guys are listening to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Credibility, I think, is the word you're looking for. If I can jump off of that real quick. And just... Oh, you people are cheating. 
Um, so if you are training somebody on the start and strength program and they're going up in weight every time and you notice a form deterioration as they're going up, at what point do you need to like, tell that person to keep the weight the same on the basis of technique? Well, it, you shouldn't allow that to happen. It, it gets fixed. The, if you're coaching somebody one-on-one, -on -one, that never occurs. Because it's your fault if they're doing it wrong. With a the weight, they previously did wrong, you know, before. You, it's your job to fix it the minute it occurs. That's what's so valuable about having a coach there. That should never occur. I mean, your job is to keep that from happening. That's why they hired you. Right? Right. Okay. What's the next Asgard book? <clears throat> we just got the fucking thing out. What no, you I doing? read it. I need another one. Uh, do you want another one? I do. Okay. I'll, I'll have one out in a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah it does seem like it, a diet book. A macro I'm not going to write a book. diet well, book. Well, you, you, you might. I don't know anything guys. about diet. I might make a cookbook. You might. That'd be good. Bar uh, chili. Might make a cookbook. We've thought about that. It's just so damn photography dependent. We don't know any photographers. <laughs> it's like, like the slide goes in. Test to see if the staff's listening. That's all I have for today. That's all you've got? That's all I've got. All right, now let's, let's go back it. through. And if anybody's got a second question. All right. In your. On the other hand, starting strength coach got his user guy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Doug, you got another question? Yeah. Is there any chance we can get an audiobook version of your books? You know, we're working on that. Really? Because yeah. it would be fabulous. That's it how I study. Be, it is would be. I yeah, we're working on that right now. The, the problem with the audiobook you can is. Yell at us while we well, no, I'm going to read the book to you, not while you squat. I'm just going to read the book. I probably won't yell, but I'll... The, the, the problem is actually is the audio recording, all right? So here's some of the problems with the audio recording. Under normal circumstances, audio books are recorded in some type of studio where it's quiet, where the walls have got eggshell foam on the way, and you've got a... You've got a or in a closet. Uh, in a, it's a small room. Three guys in my neighborhood with that kind of studio. Right. But the problem is, to do that here, uh, how, do you, how do you air condition a room that long without noise from the, from the air conditioner coming in over the microphone? Because if it's a small room, it heats up. You can't stay in it very long, and that breaks up the recording. So a normal... Uh, recording studio has got a bigger room with you know air conditioning vents at removed from the microphone so it's not a big deal we don't have a room that size here I could do it back there in the corner but there's gonna be street noise there'll be some gym noise I don't know how important it is to not have any background noise on an audio book I know the industry standard is quiet do you have any audio books that you listen to that have any background noise at all how distracting would it be if there was gym noise in the background of an audio book about lifting weight? I listen to your podcast in the car every single day. Yeah. Hey, Rip, it's, a, it's not a macro cast. It's a narrow cast. Right. We're gonna well, to I'm, you know, this is kind of what I'm, this is kind of what I'm thinking is that if we're just going to probably set up in the middle of this room, anybody else? I do have one thing. All right. Which one is it? So I, I think I might be able to say something that nobody else in the room can. All right. I remember watching you on public access television. Oh, God, that was 30 years ago. Yeah. But I don't – obviously, I was uh, very young. So, yeah. Uh, I don't remember exactly what you were what, – what it was about. Obviously, it was about training. But what, was, what were the methods then? Oh, it was just conventional wisdom horseshit before, I'd, before I had developed any of this. It's embarrassing. I hope nobody has a and copy of any of it. When did you cut the sweet mullet? Do what? When did you cut the sweet mullet? 
when my fucking hair fall out, <laughs> fell out. That's what, you know. Yeah? It may or may not have been Channel 10. It was Channel 10. Yeah. WFTV is what it was. And then I had a radio show over on 620 AM for uh, about three years. But uh, where Joe Tom White was? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 620 AM, guy named, uh, uh, what was the guy's name? That uh, Don Juan was the guy that owned that radio station. 620 AM, that was a 10,000 watt AM station at a low frequency. The damn thing covered 10 states. Yeah. yeah it, was a, it, was a, it was a big, you know, for old-timey radio station, but it was... And then they signed off and sold that frequency down to. There's a six six twenty still on the air in Dallas. Mm -hmm. It's a different station. Huh. Yeah. When, when did you decide that people like me could be strength trained successfully and decided to pursue people like you? Yeah. Not non. What kind of person are you? Non athletic, skinny. The day I bought people. the damn gym. Okay. How do you think you make a living in the gym business? I've you think you make a living in the gym business coaching lifters or athletes? No. <laughs> no. Nobody makes a living in the gym business coaching lifters and athletes except Louis Simmons. Okay. To the extent that Louis Simmons makes a living, yeah. you, you – you can't make money off of those people. You have to make money off of people that walk into the gym and say, how much are your memberships? <laughs> because that's what they always say. Right. And you tell them. Well, I mean, a lot of other people own gyms that don't do that. That's why I was And they're not making any money. Well, they seem to be. I don't well, know. You maybe maybe not as be. much as you. But. No, they're not. There, there's not any gym. Is, is there a gym in the whole entire world that makes a living off of, yeah. av, off of narrow casting to athletes and lifters? They, they, you can make it look like that on the internet. But that's not what's going on. Okay, well, I guess, I guess I phrased it incorrectly. Then, they open a gym and they get memberships, but they don't focus it on hey. You skinny guy can get your squat from 135, potentially up to 250, 300. To whatever. 450, 500. Yeah. Right? Well, that's because they don't know how. I mean, this is the first place I've ever uh, heard this. They don't I? know how. Once again, we are narrow casting. We're dealing with <laughs> a part of the population that's intelligent enough to understand what we're telling them. And unfortunately, that leaves out lots and lots of people in the, in the fitness industry. Now, if you go over to the YMCA out here on Southwest Parkway, is anybody that work in that building smart enough to understand what we do here? Yes. No. <laughs> no, you're wrong. You're wrong about that. They're, they're not, you know... Look, a brand new 30,000 square foot Gold's Gym is opening right over there. You can throw a rock and hit the front window of this building from right here. They couldn't throw a rock that far. They can't, <laughs> but, but we got people that can throw a rock that far. The, the vast majority of the people that, that work in that gym have not got the slightest idea of what we're doing. They're going to sell memberships to the general public. They're not going to sell memberships to athletes. It's Gold's Gym. It's just a place to go exercise. It's a bigger version of Planet Fitness. Yeah. That's all it is. But in terms of the people that work over there, do any of them understand this shit? No. No. I mean, Never that's what will. I'm not interested in it. They're not, they've already got, hey, we got this. Yeah. Right? We got this. But you were interested. That's that's the interesting part to me. Is it was it because of your strength training background that you thought this, or your experience yeah. coaching people that you knew yeah. this would work? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many people do you have down at your place that are just athletes? 
very few. Not, no gym makes a living off of the high end, off the lifters, the bodybuilders, especially the fucking bodybuilders, and the, uh, and the high level athletes because they represent a tiny fraction of the population. You, it's mathematically impossible to train a whole bunch of people that are in that demographic unless you're at the D1 level at a college. In which case, all of them are like that. And as I previously explained, if all of those people are that athletically freaky in terms of their talent, it doesn't make any difference what you do with them. It's going to look like your program works. If you guys went seven and six this year, then you, by definition, are a successful strength and conditioning coach. It's just, I don't know, it's hard to, hard to process that, isn't it? But that's, <laughs> that's the fact. So this isn't necessarily a question. I think it's more of something that I experienced that I think would be good for everyone to hear. Um, I'm not going to <coughs> testify. I'm not going to explain you know, saying names and associated with but just to give you an idea of the world of um, athletic performance. Um, I used to work at one of these performance places, and what they specifically look for when it comes time for combine season, um, they specifically look for football players with a track background um, because they just want fast players. And so what ends up happening is they, they will approach these players and they will say, hey, we're going to let you train at our facilities for free or at a very discounted price. Ah. And so they're going to come. So they're work. skewing the demographic. Right. Over. So then right they're going to they come work out at the facility in preparations for the NFL Combine. And not to name names, but one of their athletes ended up running like a couple years ago for 240. Then all of a sudden they slap their name and with his likeness. And then general public see that and say, oh, so-and-so trained here. He ran a 4-240. He, like, they take all the credit for 20-plus years of training or the fact that he's just a genetic freak. Right. So, so just to, to give you guys some idea, and then we have kids in elementary school paying thousands of dollars for training, and they're in fifth grade. So With the hope that you can... Get this. Yeah, 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 I understand. So just, I understand. just to give some insight. We're going to get him from an 18-inch vertical to a 36-inch vertical. Yeah. I mean, look at all the people we've got with 36-inch verticals. We know what we're doing. Yeah, you're right. That level of dishonesty does. Yeah. That's what fuels the... And that's why I stepped away. Yeah. It, yeah, it's, bull it's complete bullshit. A moral person can't stay in that environment. You know, but that doesn't stop it from taking place, does it? So here's the, we had a guy here, we had a guy here that I actually trained who was a freak. He was a freak, I'll say this right up front, he's the freakiest athlete we've ever had here. The uh, summer between his junior, between his sophomore and junior year, at a body weight of 175, he squatted 495 below parallel. He's a kid, squatted 495. We timed him at a 421 machine time 40 on that track right out there. But I never said anything except kid's a fucking freak. You know. Now I did show him how to squat. And he's one of the few athletes while in high school and actually trained here for three years. He had enough sense to know he needed to come in and train and he'd be better if he did. And he wasn't particularly coachable, but he did come in and train. He squatted below parallel, he deadlifted, he pressed and bench pressed. Mm -hmm. He did what I pretty much told him to do, his own version of it. Yeah, and I mean. Went was, down to Rice and started at quarterback the uh, he was, he, they didn't red shirt him, they started him, and he started his first game, uh, sixth game of the season, first string guy got uh, hurt. He started a quarterback, you know, about halfway through his freshman year, was the quarterback at Rice the whole time. Yeah. I saw him one night, you're talking about that 315 curl, 
that you saw Yaklich do. Uh, this kid weighing 195 pounds, reverse curled, reverse curled, 195 pounds on a two inch bar. Took it out of the rack and put it back in the rack. Two inch bar. Try deadlifting that sometimes. And I, I know that didn't sound like a lot of weight, but I'm just telling you that's. Probably. I think he did. Yeah. Talk about Henderson. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he did. There's yeah. no doubt. And another, and, thing, uh, another thing that I found that was kind of it, interesting was there was some NFL players that were between teams, play, you know, training at these facilities, and you know they'd be there for you know several months and. And I was just surprised that, you know, when you think of these NFL players, you think of them as kind of being the pinnacle of human performance and that they're, you know, they're the strongest in every, in every aspect. But I was very surprised on how weak, um, you know, some of these putting up average numbers that most general population can, well, can the, achieve. And, and what does that tell you? That adequate. potential is being wasted. Right. Because I assure you that a guy like that, who's using, like, who's squatting 275 but has a vertical of 36. Mm -hmm. There isn't any reason in the world why using these methods, you couldn't have him squatting 500 in nine months. Mm -hmm. There's zero reason why that would happen. Yeah. And it's just the, the physical therapy aspect is just taken over to the point where it's just like most of them, if you talk to them, Every single one I talked to said they were always the strongest when they were in college. Right. And I was a part of a college program, and the intensity was insane on how hard they, they train. And they lift heavy weights, but they're squatting, they're benching, you know, they're doing all those type of things. Well, in some one, programs yeah, they are. At, at least the one I was at, they were. Right. And so Now you um, go to Michigan, the right. program with Gittleman. Right. So, oh, did I? No, no, I'm saying... That program was a one set to fail your hammer strength program. Right. So, but it was just kind of interesting because then, you know, they spend thousands of dollars, spend all this time, and after three months, they've improved their 40 time by a tenth of a tenth of a second. But it's like, okay, you could have spent that time getting their, you know, their lifts up 50, 100 pounds, whatever. And it's just like, from a time and money standpoint, it's just you're wasting their time. It's a complete waste of potential. Yeah. Guy with that kind of athletic potential that's not squatting 500, it's not deadlifting 550, it's not cleaning 350, not pressing 225 overhead. Why not? Why not? You know how much harder the guy will hit you? Yep, that's the question. This isn't I complicated, asked. you know. Yeah, that's what I asked. And, uh, but we're going to do functional training. See? Right. We're going to do functional training. We're going to dance around in a ball and in the floor with a ball in one hand and a three pound dumbbell in the other hand on a wobble board and shit. And 